Welcome to Flat, Cool, and Acid Free, an OK State Archives podcast bringing you stories about Oklahoma State University and Oklahoma through archival collections. On this episode... So the one I really liked uh, was the old Animal Husbandry Building. It's, it's where the part of the uh, Noble Research Center is now. It had a large arena in the center. It was used for livestock shows and those David of Peters, head of the OSU Archives, talks with Chrishela Smith about changes the campus has seen throughout history. Many of our audience members may or may not know that 126 years ago, we had the first class. And um, where were those classes held? So uh, students enrolled in the started classes on December 14th and they were not held on campus. There was nothing on campus. So they met uh, for the first classes in buildings uh, downtown uh, Stillwater and in one or two of the churches uh, in Stillwater. And so those were the first facilities that were available. And so that's where the students first met uh, for classes early on. Within a few years though, uh, they were able to uh, transition into some temporary buildings, uh, wood, wood frame buildings that were built uh, in the southeast corner of campus. And then eventually uh, Old Central was completed a few years after that. And Old Central became the main significant building for classes, for offices, for laboratories, for everything. Uh, so that but it took a few years. So first classes were not held on campus. And on our Facebook page, we get a lot of questions or comments about dormitories that were here on campus. Can you tell us a little bit how has residential life changed over the years? Quite a bit. Um, we didn't have our first uh, residence halls uh, until almost 20 years after we formed the college. Um, initially, most of the students lived in Stillwater. Uh, either they were a member of a family here, and so they just stayed with their family, or if they, they would rent from a family here in town. Uh, it wasn't until after World War II, really, that we began a, a large student population from outside of the Stillwater and Payne County area. But our first residence halls uh, began to go up um, in uh, 1909, Crutchfield Hall. It was a men's dormitory. Uh, it was located um, roughly, uh, well, it's where this uh, engineering, engineering architecture and technology, that new addition to the east of engineering north. Um, that area is where Crutchfield Hall sat. It was the men's dormitory, uh, and that was the first one, 1909. And then a year later, uh, they finished, um, it, was the, it was called the Women's Building or Domestic Science Building. It's where the Bartlett Center for the Studio Arts is now. Uh, and that building uh, was, was a self-contained unit for, for women on campus. So they, they had a cafeteria uh, and a gymnasium on the first floor. Uh, they had offices and uh, classrooms on the second floor for the domestic science classes. And then the third and fourth floors were the residence hall area for the, for the women. They, they used to tease the women that they could enter that building as a freshman and leave four years later uh, with a degree without ever having left the building. That didn't happen. But anyway, uh, but now it's the Bartlett Center for the Studio Arts. Um, and the, 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 the men's residence hall didn't have a cafeteria, so they would come over to the women's residence hall and eat in their cafeteria on the first floor. It would have been on the first floor on the, on the west side of the building. Those were the earliest ones. Uh, uh, in, in the mid-20s then, uh, this is uh, Hanner Hall. This is the, the residence hall. It was for men, and it was recently uh, torn down uh, in preparations for building uh, the new Spear School of Business. So it's, it's where the Spear School is now. Uh, it was named for Carter Hanner. Uh, he was a student at uh, OAMC, Oklahoma Agricultural Mechanical College, and uh, was a local student who died uh, during World War in, during his service in World War I. And then the other one across is still there. It's called Thatcher Hall. That was named for the first woman graduate of Oklahoma A&M, uh, Jessie Thatcher Bost. Uh, but it's named Thatcher Hall, and it is still with us today. So let's answer some of the questions we have here already. Hannah Fortney would like to know, do you have a favorite building on, other than the library here on campus? Well, I, I have two, one that doesn't exist anymore and then another one I still like. So the one I really liked uh, was the old Animal Husbandry Building. It's, it's where the part of the uh, Noble Research Center is now. It had a large arena in the center. It was used for livestock shows and those kinds of things. But even in the heat of summer, uh, it was a very cool place to go and relax. Um, so in the arena, you know, it was, the floor was filled with sawdust. Uh, there were still trees on the east and west sides. There was a wonderful breeze that just would waft through there. It was just, a, a, to me, it was a, a wonderful place, a wonderful building. And I, I spent quite a bit of time uh, just sitting in the arena. I'd be reading, studying, uh, but that was my favorite place to go when I was an undergraduate. Uh, Old Central is still my favorite building. It's such an eclectic building. There's so many different uh, activities and functions that it was designed to, to, 
to use, be used for, uh, between classrooms and office space and the auditorium upstairs. And so I still like to go in there, uh, and uh, now the Honors College is in Old Central, but that is still my favorite building. Uh, I, I like how it has changed over time with the, the different colors they've used, and now they've tried to replicate the original colors. Um, and it's just a meaningful building for me because every, every student who's ever passed through this campus would have been exposed to. We have another question from Tatum Wallace, and she wants to know, are there any buildings on campus that are currently being used for a different purpose than they were originally used for? So we already had the one example of the women's building, which is now the Bartlett Center for the Studio Arts, Graphic Arts, mm -hmm. so that, that is different. Uh, Thatcher, which was a residence hall, uh, is now used by uh, the Military Science uh, Department. I think ROTC is over there too, but that's the military uh, offices over there. Uh, Murray Hall, which was also a residence hall initially, uh, it is now being used by the School of Social Sciences. So geography and history, you know, they're all over in, in Murray. Uh, Willard Hall, another residence hall, uh, is now the College of Education is located in it. Uh, Morrill Hall was the, was the first really main administration building. It was designed for use for the Agriculture uh, School of Agriculture, and now uh, the English department is housed in there. Uh, Whitehurst was also originally designed as a, a building for agriculture, and now you know the administration is housed over there. So uh, a number of buildings have had a variety of uses over time, and that's just a few examples right there. Uh, Gunnerson, which is also near Old Central, was originally designed as an engineering building, and I'm not sure who's in it right now. Um, but uh, it's not being used by the engineers anymore. I feel like um, the Dairy Building is a popular building that we hear a lot about. Can you tell us a little bit about that building and where was that located? Uh, the, the Dairy Building was located where the, the Bellman Center is now, uh, the Bellman Research Center. Uh, it was, so it was at that corner, uh, which was at the corner of Farm Road and uh, Monroe. And then Farm Road, of course, headed immediately west from there. And so the Dairy Barn, is located just, just west, about where uh, uh, Kerr Drummond uh, is now, is where the dairy barn was located. So that's why the dairy building was so close to, to bring the milk in from the, the dairy building and it would be processed uh, at the building from the barn. Uh, and at one time there was a dairy bar in the dairy building and it was a popular place uh, for, for people to pick up snacks and treats. Uh, you could get ice cream and milk and cheese uh, it was really a, a wonderful place to go, uh, especially in the summer times, to get ice cream. And so they had a little area in the dairy building for a dairy bar that you could get uh, snacks and treats and stuff. Uh, but that building is no longer with us. Uh, it was uh, the first building that was dedicated uh, by President Bennett after he arrived on campus. He wasn't around for the planning of it, um, but he was around for the dedication of it. So that was the first building he was involved uh, with in dedication. Did I tell you more than you ever cared to know about that one? Uh, okay. Okay, so we know that this um, student union we have currently, it didn't open until 1950. So where did students hang out before then? Well, several places. Um, I'll, I'll mention one that, that some people will remember. It was called the Y Hut. It was, it was named after the YMCA. And the Y Hut was located, um, it would be the east area uh, of classroom building now. And kind of partially in that little parking lot that's right there east of the classroom building. Uh, it was a wood frame structure, uh, and it was, it was a very popular location. People could get, you could get, it was kind of a, and they had offices in it, but it had a little cafeteria in it, and you can get sandwiches and pop and coffee and donuts and that kind of stuff. Uh, and it was just a, a neat little uh, building. It was known as the Y Hut, um, and it was there for quite a few years, very popular. The, uh, there was a couple that ran uh, the cafeteria portion. Uh, they were the Jacksons, um, and uh, um, uh, Mr. Jackson was blind. I think even Mrs. Jackson had uh, some, some sight issues, but, but I know Mr. Jackson was blind, but they ran the cafeteria uh, in the Y hut, uh, and you could get uh, kind of basic sandwich uh, snack kinds of things. Probably most people just got coffee. Um, so, but before the Y hut, um, this was an old engineering building. It's where the, the old business building that they're getting ready to move out of is located now. Um, and this was, um, uh, uh, it was called uh, the Tiger Tavern, and uh, students used to hang out in, in this building, um, golly, beginning probably in the tw late 20s, early 30s, into the 40s. It was very popular during the war, uh, during the 40s, uh, and, and then after the war in the 50s before the Y Hut was built. So that's kind of the migration of students. They're all, but they're all kind of in that 
a close proximity to each other. Um, this, this building, the old engineering building, was just across the street from the Y Hut, and of course, then the Student Union is developed uh, just uh, just south of the Y Hut. So they're all in that same vicinity. Neil Rawson, well, he would like to hear a little bit about Quonset Huts and their functions that they serve. Quonset Huts, and, and for those who aren't familiar with it, it's kind of like a like a half moon shape. Um, and these were usually um, um, uh, metal buildings with, with a, they'd usually four, pour a concrete floor and then they put up this, this quonset on top of it. They would have windows and doors, but not, sometimes not very many. But they blossomed after World War II. They were very popular on military training sites before and during the war. And then as many of these sites were broken down, um, we were purchasing quonset huts or they were shipping quonset huts to us. And they blossomed all over campus, especially uh, north of uh, Morrill Hall, between what's, what was then Thatcher and Hanner, was filled with, oh, probably a dozen or more Quonsets. Um, every, every place there seemed to be an open space where there was an open lawn area, it seemed like a Quonset would, would flourish. Uh, they were used for classrooms, they were used as offices, uh, they were used as a reading room for the library, and I think we may have a picture of that later. Um, they were used as laboratories. Some places they were used as residence halls. Uh, these things just uh, had a life of their own. Some of the Quonset huts actually lasted longer than some of our first permanent buildings. Uh, they were just designed to be temporary. Um, there was another set of them uh, north of what is the engineering area now uh, that they didn't clear out until uh, the, the Noble Research Center was being built. So they lasted a long time, uh, many of them 40, 50 years. Um, and. Uh, Served, served their purpose, uh, and then they, they've been uh, decommissioned. They've been moved on, So, uh, but they were all over campus. Okay, we have another question from Taryn Mormon, and her question is, if Old Central was the first permanent building on campus, where were the temporary buildings, and what did they look like? So there were a number of wood frame buildings. Before they built Old Central, uh, we did have some funding um, uh, from the federal government for construction, they could use for construction. And so they built a barn, they built a chemistry lab, they built a residence hall, or, I mean a residence for the president. The president didn't want to use it, the experiment station director used it for a short time, but then it was quickly converted to classroom and office space. Uh, so there were a number of wood frame buildings that, that uh, sprung up before Old Central was completed, and even after Old Central was completed, that were used for classrooms, laboratories, offices. Um, many of these were later uh, moved. They, they didn't tear them down, they simply moved them further to the north and west, repurposed them for some other function, uh, and kept using them um, for quite a while. And so uh, uh, there were very few um, brick and mortar buildings, except for Old Central early on, but there were a lot of these wood frame buildings that, that were used. Uh, and they could, they could build them fairly cheaply and, and quickly uh, and with limited funding. We have another question. Okay. And this one is from Nina Thornton, and she would like to know, how were the sidewalk paths um, chosen as the campus grew. Well, thank you, Nina. Uh, for a variety of different uh, reasons, they were they were constructed. Uh, one of the first ones I've heard about was students were tired of walking in in across muddy lawns from which is University Avenue now or College Avenue back then to Old Central. It's just a short distance, but there wasn't a sidewalk there. And so, one of the earlier uh, stories about students was that they they laid wooden planks. Uh, between the street and Old Central so they could walk on those planks. I don't know if you call that a sidewalk or not, but at least, at least provided a path. Uh, at some times, uh, sidewalks were planned, uh, so they were instrumental uh, uh, in determining, well, when they would build a new facility, how to get people from point A to point B from building to building, so they would obviously know they're going to have to put a sidewalk between those two front doors. But other times, sidewalks came in um, because students found the, the path of least resistance or the shortest path, they'd, they'd head off on a diagonal and eventually, over time, uh, the administration would just uh, say, okay, we give up, <laughs> we'll put a sidewalk uh, at that location to keep the, keep the lawns uh, uh, better looking. Um, sidewalks, you know, not only serving as a, as a path from, from different places on campus, but other times they would put up uh, hedges. In the 60s, they, they, they planted hedges along some of the sidewalks in order to prevent uh, the movements of large crowds of people from one part of campus to other parts of campus that have to go through these little uh, holes in the hedge or, or sidewalk areas to get around an area and so uh, it was just a way of, of crowd control. But anyway, sidewalks came in through a variety of different reasons. We have okay. another question All right. and that's, I've heard a lot about um, libraries being held in different buildings. Mm -hmm. So we'll start here with Old Central. So when Old Central was completed, 
uh, like I said, it was a multi-function, multi-purpose building, so offices, classrooms, labs. Uh, there was an auditorium uh, on, on the second floor where it's still located. But there was also a room that was designated for the library. To the east of Old Central uh, was the first library. Uh, now, it was used for other purposes, too. There was also classrooms in there. But the main function of this next building uh, was to serve as a library. It was also called Williams Hall later on. Uh, Biological Sciences was in there. Um, but uh, um, this library building, it was, it was a classic um, structure. It looks kind of like a, a, a castle with turrets. If people have been to Guthrie, Oklahoma, uh, and looked at their downtown area where they preserved some of these buildings with a very similar style, uh, they're, they're the similar style because they have the same architect. Uh, Joseph Folkhart was the architect for this building uh, and for many of the buildings in, in downtown Guthrie uh, when it was the state capital. And so this was uh, then the first major facility for the library. Um, it had a reading room uh, on the first floor, and uh, not, not that different from some of our reading rooms now, um, but it was a space for students then um, uh, to do studies and, and uh, reference materials and utilize the library. Uh, then in the early 20s, uh, a second building that was exclusively a library was built. So this was just the library. Um, it's located roughly where the uh, Conical Phillips Alumni Center is now, uh, to the south section of that. Uh, it was a, uh, a two-story with a, a third story that had very little space on it, basically a two-story building. Uh, the main entrance was from uh, the east side, because the, the main entrance faced towards Old Central. That was still considered the center of campus. Um, but there was another entrance on the south side. Um, so that was the first building exclusively used as a library. So that's some of the pre-current library locations uh, over time. Uh, the library started in the you know, southeast corner. It's continued to move to the northwest, where we currently are. So we have some more questions. All right. And this first one is from Anthony Jones. He says, campus has the action abstraction bronze sculptures until July. Have there been any other temporary public art projects on campus? I don't know if, I don't, I'm not sure, I don't know much about that. Uh, I know um, students have occasionally put things up, <laughs> whether they were approved or not, whether people consider them art or not, I don't know. Uh, I know there have been some public uh, art things uh, on display, um, but it's been a while. That's that's outside of my wheelhouse. I'm not sure. I don't I don't have a good answer for Anthony on that one. Um, but I do I, I do appreciate the fact that we have those pieces now uh, on display, and, and I hope they. Um, I think there's really an effort by the, the landscaping uh, crew uh, to integrate art, um, and and there are other pieces of art that are located on campus. That new welcoming center center um, in the southeast corner uh, near the Paul Miller Building, where you have the um, uh, the horses are there. Uh, there's other pieces of art uh, by the Seratine Center. There's actually a number of artistic uh, representations, uh, designs that are integrated into campus. I don't know of any others that are temporary though, uh, and I'm not sure how much longer we'll have these or whether they may become permanent. So, okay. We have another question from William Davis. He says, we all know Theta Pond as it is today, but what was there originally? And how has that changed through the years? So originally there was nothing there. It was just a, a prairie. Um, and so uh, they dug it out fairly early on as they were trying to uh, develop sources of water on campus. So they, they dug out that was a naturally low spot for the campus. Um, dug it out using a team and, and um, um, uh, a grader uh, and moved the dirt to the side uh, to form a, a retaining wall. Uh, it was acted acted not only as a, as a way to collect water, mostly for uh, livestock uh, that were uh, kept in that area. The first, uh, it was a major barn, it was about three stories high, it was located roughly between where Willard and Whitehurst are now, it was a large, beautiful barn, three stories high. A number of the livestock were kept there, and so that, that pond, the college pond or the horse pond, uh, was built just south of that location uh, for, for the livestock. It also acted as, as a retention area to collect any runoff from the barn so it wouldn't, uh, contaminate the water downstream. And so it served multiple purposes uh, originally. Uh, it was named for the Kappa Alpha Theta house uh, later on where the, the Theta, Kappa Alpha Thetas were uh, located just across the street uh, where the Zeta Tau Alpha house is now. Uh, the Thetas were at that location and the pond for some reason got named for them. The Thetas are no longer at that location, but the, the Theta name stuck. 
um, but it was known as the College Pond, the Horse Pond, uh, and then the, it's been known as State Pond for the longest amount of time. Originally, it was um, not developed at all. I mean, especially when it was used just as a watering hole uh, for the livestock. It wasn't until uh, really in the 30s, uh, and then especially into the 40s and 50s, as, as Willard Hall and Murray Hall are developed in that area, it was more of a residential area, and then they began increasing or improving the landscaping around uh, Theta Pond, uh, putting in the stone uh, connections, the sidewalks, the benches. Uh, and it's really, it's still, it's, uh, you know, earlier I was asking about my favorite buildings, but that's one of my favorite places on campus. It's just an idyllic little place to go, especially uh, when you just want to get away and, and watch, the, watch the ducks. So, uh, uh, but it's, it's changed quite a bit over the years. It's got beautiful landscaping now. Uh, I think it's a wonderful spot on campus. Okay. Well, speaking of Theta Pond, we have a question from Sarah Coates, and it's about Theta, po uh, Theta Pond. She says, I've heard a rumor that an alligator which lived in Theta Pond made it into one of the fraternity or sorority houses. Is this a true story? What really happened? So there was an alligator that lived in Theta Pond. He was a small, he was probably not more than two and a half, three feet in length. His name was Sam, I think, or Sammy. Um, uh, somebody brought him up, probably from Texas or Louisiana. Uh, he didn't reside in Theta Pond very long, um, but he was um, uh, a resident for quite a while. Uh, during the winters, uh, the physical plant at the time, now it's facilities management, but the physical plant would, would extract him from the pond uh, and keep him over the winter and then put him back in. Uh, but he never got very big. Um, and uh, he died uh, fairly young. Uh, they think he got uh, some kind of pneumonia. I can't remember exactly the details on that. Uh, they did take him to the vet, vet college. Um, this was, I think, in the 40s, or early, probably in the early 50s, because the vet college is, is in the 50s. So, but the, the vets um, uh, looked at him and I think determined the cause of death. I think it had to do with the cold. Uh, just what, this is not the climate, especially in the wintertime for alligators. So. Uh, but yeah, we had uh, uh, Sam or Sammy, uh, the alligator, lived in Theta Pond for a short time. And, and, and occasionally, fraternity boys especially, uh, or fraternity men, would, would, uh, would capture him uh, and, and like try to release him in, in some other fraternity's house or something. Just, but he wasn't big enough to really cause a whole lot of damage. I mean, I think his, his head probably wasn't bigger than you know, four or five inches long. So he wasn't, he wasn't a, a, a dangerous creature. But we did have an alligator and lived on campus. How cool. We have another question from Mariah Boyle. And her question is, what can you tell us about the barns at the research station just off of Western? Okay, so the Agricultural Research Station uh, now is located at the corner of, of Western and Highway 51 or 6th Street. Um, and so that, that large, um, the biggest barn, I think it's called Barn A, um, um, so what happened, originally the campus, most of the campus was Agricultural Experiment Station, and then as classrooms and office buildings and laboratories moved and moved to the northwest, the Experiment Station kept getting pushed further and further to the west. So like the Magruder plots, which were originally on campus, are now out at the Agricultural Experiment Station west of Western. Um, but Barn A, and I think it's on the National Historic Register now, uh, was a huge barn I uh, built out there. Uh, th there's another administrative building out there. I think it was the, like the seat house or something. But um, uh, but the, the the new barns uh, began uh, being established in the agriculture experiment station area there uh, west of the main campus. You know, initially also there were a number of barns along Farm Road. That's where it got its name. But those barns too were actually you know pushed further to the west. And so now there's some barns still along Virginia. The sheep barn is is out there. Uh, off of McElroy is the dairy barn. So all of those barns have been pushed out into that area uh, west of Western uh, and, and most of them north of 6th Street. The only barn that was south of 6th Street at one time was the hog or swine barn uh, and that facility is no longer used. They've, they've created a new barn which is over in the near closer to the rest of the barns uh, on the north side of 51. So a uh, number of facilities out there but Barn A is just a classic uh, gable roofed uh, barn uh, and it's a wonderful facility, and I, I do believe it's on the National Historic Register. Awesome. So, David, we've talked about a lot of transitions today and a lot mm -hmm. of different buildings. Where can people go to, to, to see more about these buildings? Well, we'd be happy to share what we, we can with them at, in the archives, but we have a site. Um, it's um, History Pin, 
which is built on a Google Maps platform. And we have a site in the archives here where we have set up uh, different themes. So we can, you can look at the barns over time, but you, you actually bring up a map uh, and enlarge it. And then you can, you can see pictures of where these buildings were located because there are dots or little pegs at those locations. And so you can look at the facilities over time. Uh, you can take tours. Uh, so there's a, a lot of images that we've, we've moved onto the history pin platform. We encourage people to look at it. If they have any questions about getting access to it, um, let me know. This segment was part of the Archives Live, a monthly video broadcast on the Archives Facebook page. Join us there to ask questions, share your story, and see photos from the OSU archival collections. From the folks at Oklahoma State University Libraries and the Archives, thanks for listening. And always remember to keep your archival material flat, cool, and acid-free. Interested in hearing other library podcasts? Add Amplified Oklahoma and Dear Oklahoma to your playlist. The host for this episode was Chris Shayla Smith with guest David Peters and was produced by Nina Thornton. The music is It's a Process, composed by Ben Stone and Finley Green, and published by BBC Production Music, PRS. Music